Name three parts of worship that are not singing, praying, or preaching. Leave it down in the comments. Welcome to The Whole Truth, everyone, where I am taking you through the entire Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation without skipping anything. If that sounds good to you, make sure to reach down and hit the little subscribe button below. But more importantly, open up your Bible to Exodus chapter 35. That is unless you're listening on the new podcast and driving. No opening up your Bibles if you're driving right now. That would be unsafe. Everybody else, I want you to open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 35 as we talk about three parts of worship that aren't preaching, praying, and singing. Preaching, praying, and singing are wonderful parts of worship that we do in church every Sunday, but they're not the only parts of worship. We can worship God in other ways. And I'm gonna show you three of those out of Exodus chapter 35. Let's start with the first few verses. Then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said to them, these are the words which the Lord has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Now this is a repeated commandment. Moses is telling the Israelite people a commandment that they've already heard before, that they're supposed to work for six days but take the seventh day off. Now number one, the reason they do that is because we've seen that example from God. But also they're supposed to do that because the Israelite people are following the law as a great typology of Jesus who from their perspective was yet to come. Jesus who was to come would fulfill. The Messiah was going to come and he would fulfill the law. And so we would one day have this Messiah where we would find our rest. And by the way, Messiah has come. His name is Jesus. And he came, the son of God, who never sinned, died on a cross for our sins, and then rose again three days later and has offered us new life. And if you put your faith in him, then what he offers you is rest. Rest from the law, rest from your work, rest from your sin, freedom from your sin. He has offered to you salvation. You see, these acts of worship that we're going to talk about do not make for salvation. Salvation is found by putting your faith in Jesus. Will you rest in that? Or will you still hold on to some thing that you've done? You see, what we do is we want something. I want something I can grab a hold of. That's salvation, right? Like give me a prayer to pray, a thing to do, something to repent of. I want something that, that I can, that's tangible that I can hold on to and say, look, I did this. But truthfully, salvation has nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. It is by faith and faith alone. And then you have to find your rest in that. Sometimes that that is one of the hardest things to do is to just accept that you can do nothing, but you can put your whole trust in him and he's already done the work. That's where salvation comes from. So let me just flip that around and say it this way. You could do all of these acts of worship that I'm about to talk about that won't make you a Christian, that won't mean you're saved, that won't mean you're going to heaven if you wanna say it that way. That's not what it means. It would be futile if you haven't found your rest in him. Okay, now, not only do we find our rest in him, but let's talk about these acts of worship. The first one is this commandment of um, obedience to this, to this um, Sabbath law. Hey, make sure that you only work for six days and take the seventh day off. And that makes a really great point. One act of worship that you and I can do is simple obedience to God's commands. If God has said it, we should be obedient to it. And that in and of itself is an act of worship, to simply be obedient. And that's one of the hardest things. Think about it like this. To the Israelite people, God is saying, take a day off. How much would you love it if your boss at work said, take a day off? I, I just want you to take the day off. As a matter of fact, I want you to make sure that you take a day off every week. I want you to just take a day off. No work, nothing extra, no overtime, just take a day. Doesn't that sound wonderful? I mean, what a, what a wonderful commandment God could give them. Take a day and rest. And yet, even in such a simple commandment, the Israelite people struggled with this. 
And the same is true for you and I. God gives us simple commands. Some of them are good things. They're, in other words, they're, they're literally just good for our daily lives. And yet somehow we find ourselves, because we're rebellious in our spirit, we rebel against those. So one act of worship is to simply obey what God has said. Now, I'll give you another. Pick up with me in verse 4. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring an offering as an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, badger skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. All who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded in the tabernacle, its tents, its coverings, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the ark and its poles with its mercy seat and the veil and its coverings and the table and its poles and all its utensils and the showbread. Also the lampstand for the light, its utensils, its lamps and the oil for the light, the incense altar, its poles, the anointing oil, the sweet incense and the screen for the door at the entrance of the tabernacle, the altar of the burnt offerings with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils and its laver and its base and its hangings, its cord, its pillars, their sockets and the screens for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle, the pegs of the court, their cords, the garments of the uh, of ministry for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister as priest. Oh my goodness. There, God says to Moses, tell the people to bring an offering. Bring an offering. Listen, this is the second thing that you can do to worship God is make an an offering. Now you actually see this in church service. In some way or another, if you go to Sunday morning church, you will see giving. But I want to challenge you. Do you see your giving as a necessary means to an end? Or do do you see it as an act of worship? I want you to really think about that. I know for myself, there have been times in my life that I've viewed my giving to the church as a means of keeping the church going, making sure that the programs were going or that the pastor was paid or whatever my, it might have been in my head at that time. But listen, my giving is not just the material side of things. It is an act of worship. Think about this. God owns everything. God could materialize anything he wanted at any moment. He spoke into existence the entire universe, our entire world, our entire lives. He spoke that with the breath of his mouth. He doesn't need my gift. My gift is nothing to what he has, literally nothing. I am but dust. What can I offer him? So why would God, who could speak anything he wanted into existence, I mean, imagine right now if you had a genie in a bottle and you could wish anything into existence, even if it was just three things. There's entire movies and stories based on that idea that if you had three wishes, how much you could actually accumulate and you could do with even just those three things that you could just materialize. God could materialize anything he wanted because genies aren't real, but he is. He could make whatever he wanted, but he has chosen to include you in his kingdom work by allowing you the chance to make an offering to him, to give to him. Now you can do that in church, but you can do that in other ways as well. You can give to him. Is your giving an act of worship? Are you following him? Are you worshiping him and giving to him? Is that your mindset? Because that's what he really wants. So we've got simple obedience, your offering. Let's do one more. We actually already read it. What we see is that there's all of these people who are skilled artisans. They are skilled in the work and they're going to build the tabernacle. And so God tells them, make sure that you all do the work. If you're one of these skilled people, one of these skilled artisans, make sure that you do the work. Let's read it. Let's read the last part of the chapter and see it for ourselves. Chapter uh, 35 and verse 20, and all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought to the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for its services and for its 
holy garments. They came both men and women, as many as had a willing heart, and brought earrings and nose rings, rings and necklaces and all jewelry of gold. That that is every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord, and every man with whom was found blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, goats hair, red skins of rams and badger skins brought to them. Every one who offered an offering of silver or bronze brought it to the Lord's offering, and every one with whom was found a case of wood for any work of the service brought it. All the women who were gifted artisans spun yarn with their hands and brought what they what they had spun of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen. And all the women whose hearts were stirred in wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. And the and the rulers brought onyx stones and the stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate and the spices for oil. Uh, the, excuse me, and the spices and oil for the light, for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord. All the men and women whose hearts were willing to bring material for all kinds of work which the Lord by which the Lord by the hand of Moses had commanded to be done. And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord is called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and an understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting jewels and setting and setting and carving wood and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach in him Ohiliab, the son of Ashima, the son of Dan, and he has filled them with skill to do all manner of work of, engra- of the engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue and purple and scarlet thread and in fine linen and of the weaver and those uh, who do every work and those who design artistic works. Now, I read all that because I wanted you to see right in the middle, did you notice how there's these women of wisdom that know how to spin yarn? So there's all these people giving, right? That's the second act of worship that I've told you about. One's obedience, then then simple giving, okay? Now there is following the Lord in service. And we've heard of this guy before, this Bezalel and these other people, but did you notice that Bezalel had also been given the gift to teach? And there were these women who, they spun yarn. I guarantee you as, as these women sat in their tents and they spun yarn, They probably never really saw it as that big of a deal. They probably, they spun yarn. I mean, you could imagine they're sitting there at their wheels, they're spinning yarn or their looms or whatever they're doing. They probably don't see it as like the biggest thing. But you know what? The Lord needed that in the tabernacle. So what they had spun, they were gifted and skilled and wisdom and to know how to spin yarn. And they were able to take what they had spun and gave that. So there's more than just offering of your um of your goods, of your gold and silver and precious stones and wood. I mean, goodness, wood, that's precious right now, isn't it? But but that's beyond the point for a second. Understand what I'm saying. There's also worshiping God through your service. And notice how many people had an ability to do that. Even from those all the way down to just spinning the yarn, those who know how to weave the tapestry, those who know how to do the work of the engraver and to set the stones, there was a lot of work to be done in this tabernacle. And this guy Bezalel was not all by himself just running around like a robot making it all happen. No, he was he was the shop foreman. He was he was seeing overseeing what people were doing and he had a full vision of what God wanted for the tabernacle. But all the people were getting involved in service, and that ought to include you too. If you're part of the kingdom of God, if you've put your faith in him and you found rest in Jesus, that's great. Rest in him. And now that you're rested, it's time to get up and get to work. There's service to be done. God has set in the church all kinds of people, apostles and teachers and preachers. Some are gifted in administrations and some are gifted in love. The Bible actually says that. Whatever your gift is and whatever your skill is, serve the Lord with it. That is an act of worship when you serve him. And remember, that ought to be done with a willing heart. I hope that you guys have enjoyed today's video and I'll see you tomorrow as we get into Exodus chapter 36. See you then.